So the next speaker is Ryan Haidari. He's Director of Technical and Product Management at uh, Qualcomm. Uh, Ryan joined Qualcomm in 2004, and since then he has been working as Director of Technical and Product Management. He has been active in uh, TIA TR45.5 CDMA Technologies, and he was a Vice Chair for the Speech Coding Group. He has participated in many technical papers and publications, including few granted patents. Thank you, Alex. I, uh, thanks for the introduction. Um, so uh, my discussion is going to be a follow-up of uh, what Stefan just did, but more specific to Volti and uh, also a terminology that you may not be familiar is called voice over mobile broadband. Um, I do have a couple of slides and, uh, you know, on EBS as well, but uh, forgive me if there's a little bit of overlap from that perspective. Uh, so I thought that uh, perhaps it's best to start from uh, uh, you know, a slide that shows the evolution in the wireless modem <laughs> technology in particular. Uh, I, my intent was not to include this uh, to uh, give you a, a more of a uh, bit comparison between these different access points. But the, the intent was to show you that, the, first of all, of course, the evolution the, uh, yeah, as you can see, in 1985, when we started, or earlier, slightly earlier, was when we had the analog amps technology. And then uh, the evolution of these 20 plus 30 years uh, uh, it was mainly driven for a better uh, throughput. Uh, and in this case, I'm referencing them as a average throughput, more on the downlink in particular. And uh, you can see it's quite interesting because uh, there's a number of things you can see. One is that there, there were more than one standard involved. So that's, uh, to some extent, as you will see later, it is not really the reason for, uh, to the extent that we will see on the codec that a bit of a starting of uh, fragmentation. The multiple standards, they were going on their own path and, uh, you know, with the GSM uh, starting with the, uh, you know, initial digital uh, voice and data. And then we went to CDMA and then C2K and uh, GPRS and Edge for better data capability on the GSM. And then, of course, we went to the uh, EVDO and uh, HSPA technology and HSPA plus the, the DO even had the Rev B. But more importantly, I think is uh, uh, when we get to the LTE is where uh, I, I, I would be more focusing in that access, particular access point. And uh, we, uh, there's two flavors of that, is the TDD uh, as well as the FTD. Uh, they're both uh, becoming very popular, as you know, I think pretty much across the world. Uh, but, you know, of course, the technology doesn't stop there. There's uh, what we call LTE Advanced, uh, LTE-A, as some of you guys know. And then we go into what they call carrier aggregation. Carrier aggregation is a technique of combining uh, spectrums. Uh, you know, some operators have spectrums, but it's spread all over different, different band. So with the carrier aggregation techniques, we, we create multiple uh, carrier and allow them to combine them all together into one concatenated type of a bandwidth. And uh, you know, when, when you think about it, in fact, starting from a GSM, in terms of a coding efficiency, there was only just one bit per uh, bandwidth of one hertz per second. So you can think of that to be the best they could have done at the time. When we went to uh, WCDMA, for example, uh, they had the coding efficiency of three bit per uh, hertz of bandwidth per second. Uh, LTE was somewhere around four to five. Uh, LTE uh, dash A was somewhere around 10 to 15. And then when you go to the LTE dash A with the carrier aggregation, now you're really talking about somewhere around 30 bits of uh, uh, information per hertz uh, per second. And uh, uh, you know, although it is a peak theoretical, uh, when you're looking at the 100 uh, megahertz bandwidth, you're talking about the three gigabits per second type of a modem. Uh, that's quite impressive. I wish this would have worked, made it so much easier. Uh, I should have brought my own. Um, okay. Uh, the next slide I wanted to show you, uh, 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 you know, and this is not a surprise to anyone, uh, the evolution that is happening in telecommunication in particular. And uh, I think uh, Stefan was talking about 1700. Uh, my, my understanding is POT and the PSDN started at 1890 to be exact. So uh, still it's quite a long time ago. 
And uh, as you are familiar, the evolution has started to voice. Basically, uh, these were our, uh, the amps, uh, maybe GSM phones uh, in this picture. And uh, then becomes a, a messaging SMS. Uh, nobody thought that's going to really do much, but look at it today. And then there was this transition to MMS, uh, these multimedia messaging techniques. And uh, I believe that didn't really pan out as much as the uh, SMS did, although there are so many of those as well. The interoperability was really a major drop between this type of a messaging system. And then finally, of course, today we have uh, a fully IP-centric type of uh, multimedia services, which uh, not only allows you to uh, establish calls, it also uh, allows you to make simultaneous voice data call, uh, including uh, sharing contents and uh, uh, media, as well as uh, uh, video telephony in particular is very keen on that area. Yeah, so this one, I have to kind of do it in a step at a time. Um, I included this slide, uh, again, just purely as a reflection of uh, what I said earlier about the modem evolution versus what we see as the voice codec evolution. So uh, basically, the bubble size, it tells you uh, how popular these codecs got. And again, don't quote me on this, because it's purely a speculation to some extent estimate. I, I just made this slide, you know. Uh, obviously, 7-Eleven was one that uh, is basically everywhere. You probably, that bubble should have been 10 times bigger. But the, the intent was in there that you can see there's too many codecs. In fact, let me go to the next slide, the next part of this slide. Uh, now you're getting the cellular codecs in there. And uh, again, you're starting with the GSM, uh, you know, GSM enhanced full rate, uh, and then the Qualcomm had his own QCAP 13, and then there was a half-rate uh, version of the GSM codex. Then we had the EVRC codex on the C2K side, then AMR codex with the AMR, uh, and then AMR wideband as it's coming up uh, lately. You know, uh, uh, again, too many. But then, uh, what the, I think it, to some extent was just discussed in this uh, previous discussion. Uh, I personally believe that EVS, uh, as a standard enhanced voice services codec, has the potential to really, to some extent, convert this whole uh, fragmented ecosystem of the codecs. Uh, the EVS, as you see in the timeline, it is almost getting a 2015 commercial launch. Uh, I, I am actually responsible, to some extent, from the product development side of this codec. And, uh, I think that with the, with the whole uh, synergy that is happening within the operators for the carrier grade type of voice services, uh, this is the codec that's going to become the facto uh, default codec. You know? uh, given that, of course, AMR wideband is there, but uh, in terms of a performance, uh, throughput, EV, uh, in fact, I do have a slide on this. Uh, at, at the EBS at 13.2 kilobits per second, uh, these are some of the key features of it. Uh, uh, it is a super wideband codec, as it was discussed uh, by Stefan in the previous uh, slide. Uh, it, in, you know, it, I think the second item, this uh, improved robustness, is really one of the key attributes of this codec that allows you not to only work on the QoS type of a carrier graded Volti, it also works very well on a non QoS or QoS aver type of connection. Uh, we've demonstrated the performance of this codec at 10% erasure. And, and at the 10% erasures, uh, AMR or AMR wideband, the other sort of a cellular codec, cannot maintain a normal conversation where you barely hear the quality degradation in this codec. So that particular mode of operation of it, I think, is going to by itself, is going to justify this for voice over mobile broadband, not just the voice over LTE. It is the ideal codec for that type of services. Is a combination narrowband, wideband, super wideband, full band, all into one codec. And the reason that we did it that way is because uh, the terminals uh, could be quite different. You know, you could have a narrowband terminal uh, in terms of acoustic and transducers. You could have a wideband uh, or super wideband. So you can actually negotiate the, the bandwidth of the uh, codecs through the CBSDP negotiation. And that's the work that is in progress. The standard teams are still working on that RTP payload and STP attributes. Very quickly, again, uh, as it was demonstrated, the, the music capability all in one, music and voice all in same uh, codec. Uh, 
uh, the, the uh, other really key points in there, as I mentioned, is that the, the, the effect, the, the requirement, because it is an IP-centric type of a techniques and technology, it is really purely driven by the terminals, the endpoints. So we're expecting that the, the upgrades in the network will be quite minimal from that perspective. Okay, so the next slide I wanted to also give you a little bit of a roadmap of what's happening with LTE, in particular moving to voice over LTE. Uh, as you know, uh, initially when the LTE was developed, uh, it was basically purely a data connection uh, techniques. And uh, uh, when it was done in 2011 or so, uh, it, it was only dongles and uh, a USB card available for just uh, you know, PCs and uh, purely driven by the data. Then, uh, you know, the, obviously the operators were quite interested about this whole IP-centric backhaul of their network to lower their caps, uh, CapEx and uh, cap up. Uh, so uh, they looked at this uh, to be a replacement for circuit switch voice. But it really didn't happen because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, UMTS today allows you to do simultaneous voice data. So uh, the, dr the drive for this simultaneous voice data wasn't really there for many of the UMTS operators. But uh, contrary to that, the CDMA operators were very anxious to get that. Uh, so the, as you can see, initially, the, the, uh, many of the U UMTS operators were looking at this <laughs> still as a data connection and using the voice in the 3G, 2G. So that's where the circuit switch fallback technology came in. The CS fallback means that the circuit switch is still fallbacks into the 2G, 3G. And many of the European operators are still today doing this. In fact, that is one of the areas that uh, you know, is delaying their VoLTE deployment. But the performance is not very good. Usually the delay is quite long, and users perceive that quality degradation when they start from a data to a voice call. Uh, where we are in 2014-15 uh, is what we call simultaneous voice. This is a true simultaneous voice data, which introduced with the, uh, you know, with SRBC, the single radio voice call continuity, and allows the user to have a sim pure, you know, perfect simultaneous voice data, no interruptions in the quality. And uh, with the SRBCC, if there is a, a, a lack of LTE coverage, uh, the, the, the call falls into the 3G slash per perhaps 2G. But it's quite a lot less delay and a lot less uh, uh, noticeable in terms of uh, quality degradation. Uh, so what are the key uh, benefits of the VoLTE? I think uh, clearly the drive for this uh, was uh, voice quality. I think uh, operators uh, were looking for a reason to justify their uh, investment in this LTE VoLTE. And they wanted to have something better than circuit switch. And that clear, that's a clear goal and objective for many of the operators. Uh, but there were other factors that uh, improves the uh, sort of a voice services. Uh, the faster call uh, setup is one that is pointed in here. Uh, also, the continuity to 3G actually is driving quite a bit of that. But there are others like that is not in there, is like the, um, the, the semi-persistent uh, a scheduler that is mainly designed to give you more capacity, you know, more of a, a compromise between delay and, uh, and throughput. Uh, there's also a DRX, which uh, allows you to have a better power in your device uh, using the DRS techniques. Uh, and uh, there's this TTI bundling that allows you to um, have multiple uh, packets uh, transmitted at the same time. This is for the edge of the cell to maintain a better quality, and a number of other things. In fact, there are uh, header compression techniques like uh, robust header uh, compression techniques allows more capacity improvement. Um, other features that uh, makes this whole uh, evolution and happening more, uh, more desirably is, of course, the video telephony. You know, the video telephony, uh, in addition to all the other presence and file sharing techniques that comes with the RCS, is very desirable as part of this whole evolution. Okay, so a uh, little bit more about this voice over mobile broadband. Again, this is very unique techniques that has been introduced. And the idea behind this is that the, uh, the, uh, the carriers uh, are looking for uh, alternative, um, you know, more of an efficient and alternative method of using their existing network. Of course, they had circuit switch, they are going to Volti, but many of them, as you know, they also have HSPA or they have, uh, uh, you know, uh, what they call uh, uh, you know, carrier uh, Wi-Fi, you know, like the uh, femtos type of uh, techniques. 
And even lately now they have this, what they call LTE-U, that has this unlicensed LTE uh, access point that allows you to compete or even have better throughput than the Wi-Fi. So uh, one of the idea was in here is that can we uh, transition the voice from a, a, you know, from a Volte into this other access point, take advantage of a packet switch handoff because you will maintain your IP connectivity between uh, your Volte to these other voice access techniques. Uh, the other uh, reason for this evolution of this voice over mobile broadband is kind of a, uh, building a relationship between the uh, carrier operators and over the top players. Uh, many of these over the top players, as you know, including the big ones, they barely make any money today. There's really not much money to be made there. Uh, it's purely they have uh, five, 600 million subscribers, but when it comes to revenue, there's really not much there. So uh, when they, uh, you know, this to uh, if this voice over mobile broadband uh, nearly happens, then there is opportunity for them to work together and create this uh, backhaul IMS framework of combining these uh, services together and, uh, uh, you know, come up with some uh, better business opportunities. Uh, given that the, today, actually, this is very interesting because, uh, as you know, a lot of the second switch calls are unlimited uh, and uh, there's no additional premium added to your data plan. But when you go to the IP, uh, all IP data services, uh, it's yet to be seen that the, what the operators will decide to do. Oh God, five minutes only, okay. <laughs> so um, uh, the, uh, the, the, that is yet to be seen to exactly how that's gonna happen. I'm gonna to have to go quite fast. So I usually have a, a many more slides. Again, uh, this is just mainly for your own reference to show you that there is a, clearly a benefit of a voice over mobile broadband uh, to the operators in particular in terms of their uh, cap, uh, you know, the operational uh, terminal efficiency as well as the call flow in particular. Uh, just very quickly give you a, a sort of a snapshot of where the whole uh, evolution of this uh, roadmap is happening. Uh, the bottom two is already passed. You know, the, this was mainly uh, this uh, SVLTE or DRVCC, the dual radio technique was introduced for the um, CDMA operators because they couldn't do simultaneous voice data. Uh, the second, uh, I mentioned to you about the CS fallback, that's pretty much also gone. Most of the operators now moving toward what we call Volte, uh, but maybe without the SRVCC initially, and then they move into the, with the SRVCC the uh, roaming and interoperability between not just the you know, uh, UEs in the particular in-network call is important. It's also as important for, for uh, out of network, the, you know, between different operators, we call it the inter-operator type of calls. Uh, voice over HSPA, uh, you know, as part of this voice over mobile broadband, uh, it, uh, there are some operators quite interested in this because of the packet switch handoff and efficiency of the call flow. Uh, of course, the voice over Wi-Fi, as you know, many of the operators are looking at that as an offloading of their um, uh, traffic. Again, very quickly, I know uh, I, I usually run out of time. I don't know why. It's, it's just too much information to share, I think. Uh, the, there is this uh, concept of a quality of experience versus quality of service. Uh, many of us are familiar with the quality of service, but the, in the reality of it is that the quality of experience is, is what makes it very important. The quality of the service is more related to the network, and uh, the network efficiency comes into the picture where the quality of experience is how you represent the, the terminal to the end users. Whether or not you have, for example, multi-mic noise suppression techniques, uh, are you using a, a, a different echo cancellation noise suppression, what's the loudness of the phone, and so on and so forth. In fact, one example that they say is that bigger bandwidth doesn't necessarily translate in quality. Uh, the one example I've seen is that uh, you, if you, you could have a 10 kilohertz of band with let's say 2% of erasures, uh, but operating at the, uh, say 100 millisecond, is that better than having a 20 kilohertz of band with 1% uh, uh, erasures, but <laughs> operating in a 300 millisecond of access? So uh, for, especially for voice, of course, that's very important. You cannot really go below 300. For, for data users, that may be a compromise that can be made. So there is a lot of quality of experience versus quality of service nego negotiation with them. Uh, very quickly, again, this is just um, interesting uh, analysis of uh, the time that we spend in a daily for uh, uh, you know, using our, our, our uh, you know, uh, smartphones uh, is rated to be somewhere around 147. That, that is uh, compared to 113 minutes of use uh, on your TV. Uh, 
maybe some of you guys, I watch a little bit more TV, maybe than 113. But the uh, interesting is that, uh, uh, you know, an, another, uh, you know, a comparison in there is done by using multiple devices at your home. Uh, and somewhere around 65% of the people use their uh, tablets uh, along with the TV, you know, it's like multitasking. And um, between tablet and a smart, a smartphone is somewhere around 40%. And the last one is showing that the, uh, how the whole uh, personal information sharing with the applications are getting so popular. I'm actually wearing an iWatch today, uh, and uh, uh, it's amazing how these things work. You know, Monday through Thursday, he tells me at around 5.30, 6 p.m. what the traffic is. I've never told him this, but on Friday at 3 o'clock, he tells me how the traffic is. So he's expecting me, and he's seen me that leaving at 3 o'clock on Friday. So has that intelligent smart already built into it and uh, shares with me. OK, so one more minute. Uh, let me see what I want to share. So by the way, uh, when it comes to voice, uh, you guys probably want to comment on this. These are uh, coming from uh, uh, you know, published information. But what they're pointing is about four to five thousands of minutes per year per person. I, I usually use ten to fifteen minute, uh, you know, minutes of call per day. About maybe seven to eight persons uh, I call. So it is going down quite a bit, you know. But hopefully with the super wideband capability and the association of that with the other multimedia services, people do use the phone a little bit more. Uh, just very quickly, uh, these are the technologies that Qualcomm is driving quite a bit. You know, it's the quality of the call experience is quite important. As I mentioned earlier, we have this Fluence Fluence Pro technology that allows you to have multiple microphone noise cancellation technique, and we also have the active noise cancellation on the earpiece. Uh, the, the whole concept is at the end, it says HD voice in all calls. And that's some areas that we are constantly working to maintain that. And then additional work that we do is more for a combination of voice and audio. A natural user interface and interaction is very important for a wideband, super wideband techniques. You get a lot better uh, speech recognition accuracy. Uh, gaming, of course, uh, my son always says that when I play game, I try to download a, a voice client that has the least uh, footprint because I don't want my memory to be clobbered with the, with the voice. I want to use it for, for the game. Uh, just uh, my, uh, one to my last slide, uh, uh, basically Qualcomm has uh, multiple different uh, products. Uh, we start with the Snapdragon 200. These are basically uh, LTE-centric across uh, for, uh, for everyone. And then the 400s are the high volume um, smartphones. And then you get in the 600, you're getting a little bit more of an entertainment unit with a very high good camera display. Uh, 4K uh, video, and then the last one is basically uh, some sort of a, a you know ultra HD type of capability for tablets and uh, computing devices. Um, uh, finally, uh, uh, you know one uh, you know information that is worthwhile for you to know is that the R chip is really a combination of many many other cores. Uh, you know, it's not just a CPU in there. You know, CPU is actually less than 10 to 15 percent of the chip in terms of a silicon size. We have a, a very good uh, GPU uh, graphic uh, technology, for, uh, and then we have also a good DSP. The DSP has a floating point capability built into it, along with our modem that I discussed, and so on and so forth. That's it. Uh, so, sorry if I went a couple of minutes late. That's okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Maybe, is there any question? We can take maybe one or two questions. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so on the, the Vo H, on the Vo HSPA, so is that basically saying that at the same low end, the same way the carriers were able to say that's 4G, um, that that is the range at which you're saying to use? I'm sorry, let's start again. So on the, on the voice over HSPA, yes, uh -huh. so you're saying at the bandwidth that is equivalent to the LTE bandwidth or for all of HSPA? No, no, it could be any. Remember, uh, the reason that uh, operators don't want to do voice over HSPA today is because there is no QoS. Uh -huh. And uh, most of them don't want to go back in there and invest in the QoS. In there. It wasn't designed for voice. But with a codec like EVS, which has that error robustness built into it, you know, up to 10%, you could basically be on the best effort call on the HSPA and make a voice over HSPA. So it, it, it stays on its own band, has nothing to do with the... With well, the what happens to end-to-end -end UE delay when you go on a slower network? 
uh, you mean in, in case you're not getting a, you're, you're talking about the, the delay you're now, from you're now mouth gone, to ear piece yeah, delay. Yeah, you've now gone no. to a packet-based. It's all packet-based. Right, but is it the same, is, well, you might know this, is it the same bearer guarantee? Is it the same? Oh, so you're saying that it's not just the throughput, it could also be a delay. That was the point that I made yeah, about the network. because in yeah, LTE, you have a guarantee yeah. on the... But there must be some... You have QCI1 guarantee. You don't have that right. in HSPI, you I don't wouldn't believe. have that. So it's almost like running a Skype on a data call. I mean, the Skype... I mean, if your argument in there would be the same for a Skype, how does a Skype handle that? Well, Skype defined all their own stuff the way we defined it for LTE. There's this multi... <laughs> <So>. <laughs> There's a multi-path techniques that you can introduce and have multiple RTP payloads being transmitted to be able to improve that. In fact, one of the biggest challenges that you will see in future on the, on the client, on the voice client, is how do you handle the receiving packets, what they call digital buffer. That's a technique that makes it very unique in terms of the design of the voice services. How do you maintain that delay? How do you compensate for it and so on? Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, thank you. All right, thank you.